Hello, and welcome to This Week in the Canadian Revolution, a podcast by Fightback, the Marxist voice of labor and youth. We live in a revolutionary epoch. The crisis of the capitalist system is creating political polarization and instability in every single country, as millions of people look for a way out. The product of this is unprecedented social upheaval and yes, revolution. Now we firmly believe that the crisis of capitalism is creating the conditions for socialist revolution. Yes, even in Canada. The point of this podcast is to provide a Marxist analysis of what Trotsky described as the molecular process of socialist revolution. This week in the Canadian Revolution, uh, we are going to talk about the coming recession. Uh, the media, the mainstream economists, all the major banks, and the, even the Bank of Canada are all talking about a coming recession. We may actually even already be in one, technically. Um, don't have the numbers yet for the final quarter of the year. Um, but yeah, the Bank of Canada has been raising interest rates in an attempt to bring down inflation, um, which is... Uh, at last numbers we have is 6.9%. Um, and this is very worrying, obviously. Uh, this is going to bring, could bring on a, in, um, on a recession. Recession means bankruptcies. Uh, people can't pay their mortgages. Businesses could be folding. Uh, massive job losses. Um, and so, yeah, we are going to discuss this, why this is happening uh, and what we can do about it, what the working class can do about it. Um, to discuss this issue with me today, I have Fightback Editor uh, Alex Grant. Um, welcome on the show, Alex. Hey, Joe. Good to chat. <laughs> yeah, so um, <clears throat> in terms of this uh, coming recession, um, yeah, what is what is uh, the Bank of Canada saying about this? Isn't it, isn't it a bit weird that they... They almost seem to kind of want a recession. Yeah, yeah. So like Tiff Macklin, governor of the Bank of Canada, saying that uh, to he's more concerned about inflation than a recession. And he keeps hiking up interest rates. And and yeah, uh, he, he gonna, looks like he's going to get his wish. There's going to there's probably going to be a recession pretty soon. And uh, and how uh, hiking up interest rates uh, sort of gets us there. That makes everything, well, at the moment, everything is more expensive through inflation, but hiking up interest rates makes debt and borrowing much more expensive, makes mortgages much more expensive, and it makes it more expensive for companies to borrow, to invest for economic activity. So all of that leads to a uh, a downward pressure on the economy and and yes uh, a recession and yeah so this this theoretically i suppose according to the arguments of macklem and other capitalist economists should bring down inflation um now i might that might seem a bit confusing so why would that happen well inflation is basically the rising cost of goods so According to the supply and demand, if you basically have less demand, meaning less money chasing the supply of goods, it should bring down the price of goods. Um, so basically, that's how that's the logic of the Bank of Canada. Anyway, basically, if you want to put it in layman's terms, it's make you poor, <laughs> take money out of your pocket so that you can afford to buy less stuff, um, and that should bring inflation right down. Uh, it's sort of a yeah, it's almost like a form of chemotherapy, <laughs> trying to in inject poison into your system to address this disease. Um, uh, horrible, really, working class people, we're faced with a horrible situation right now. After a couple of years of pandemic, now the, the smart, intelligent managers of capitalism, uh, this is the cure for the problem that they are they are doling out before us. Um, it might not. And, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And it's, yeah. It's, it's only going to affect uh, a part of inflation. 
it's not going to affect supply chain shortages. Interest rates does nothing about supply chain shortages. It's not going to affect the war in Ukraine and how that increases gas prices or grain prices or sort of the general instability uh, hikes up prices. All it's going to do is affect, yes, this supply and demand, also the money supply. So raising interest rates does uh, reduce the money supply and, and, and that, whereas previously they were massively increasing the money supply. So it, even though they, they, they're jacking up interest rates all the time, it's, it, it's only partially effective and then, and can take quite a while to take effect. So you can end up having, like you could get the re recession and continue with inflation. You get stagflation. Yeah, that's 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 quite a possibility actually before us. Um, already, the interest rate has been jacked up quite significantly. It's at four point two five percent. They just increased it by another point five, um, and inflation has barely been dented. So, um, yeah, we we could very likely be saddled with a recession at the same time as we have a relatively high inflation. Um, so basically, everything's more expensive including your mortgage and other things. Anyway, we'll get get into that in a minute. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe it would serve us uh, and the listeners, uh, it, it would serve us well to go back a little bit, a couple of years and talk about like how we got here. Um, so yeah, how did we get in this pickle, right? Uh, how, how, how did, how did, why, why, why is the, the Bank of Canada basically pursue, in many ways sort of forced almost to pursue this policy or why are they pursuing, it's, a, it's sort of like a, their argument is almost like lesser evil. It's like, it's like take a bit of pain now to, to, to have a little less pain in another way later. But yeah, how did, how did we get here? Uh, Alex, right. do you want to introduce this? Sure. Well, back in 2019, we, we wrote some articles saying, that uh, the world economy is heading into a slump and a classic crisis, capitalist crisis of overproduction. Uh, so we wrote that in 2019 before COVID hit. So when COVID hit, you had your classical overproduction crisis combined with the, the pandemic. So extreme uh, slump, extreme slight crisis in the first months after COVID hit. And they responded to that by massively opening the taps of uh, government spending. They uh, estimates are something like five, oh, $700 billion of government spending. And, 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 and people say, well, you know, okay, so this was necessary for the pandemic. Well, some of it was, but most of it wasn't. Most of it wasn't. So the, the, they like to focus on the CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the $2,000 a month that people got that allowed them to keep their heads above water. That was less than $100 billion. Whereas, in fact, they, they, they sent out more than $700 billion. Actually, bigger than the CERB was the corporate wage subsidy, which is corporate handout. So massive injection of corporate welfare. And then there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of uh, forgivable interest-free forgivable loans and, and other secret loans, big corporation bailouts like Bombardier and Air Canada and, and, and other corporations got billions from, from the government. So tons and tons and tons of welfare, corporate welfare bailouts. And yes, and we said at the time, this is all going to be inflationary. Ah, and the other thing they did is print money, quantitative easing. Quantitative easing, they printed $5 billion of money every week. Now the government, uh, Bank of Canada has subsequently said, oh no, no, this isn't printing money. And then they give this long winded blah, blah, blah explanation, which is essentially, but there was no pieces of paper printed and therefore it's not printing money. And it's like, no, no, money doesn't exist as printed pieces of paper anymore. It's, it's bits on a computer, but it's the functionally, the equivalent of printing money. And of course, if you print money, just ask Weimar Republic Germany, it has massive inflationary effects. 
we predicted all of this precisely when the Bank of Canada was saying there wasn't going to be inflation. They said that in uh, 2020 and 2021. They said there wasn't going to be inflation. We predicted it uh, very clearly. In Go see our Canadian Perspectives document that we published in uh, 2020. It was 2020, right? Yeah, it wasn't 21. Um, and... Uh, and, and this, yeah, this is how we got to the present crisis. Yeah, exactly. So in many ways, they're just reaping what they've what they've sown. I mean, they've created this situation that, <clears throat> which was quite obvious that it was going to lead to this. I mean, the policies that the Canadian government, the Bank of Canada, um, were implementing in 2020 to deal with the the collapse of the economy, um, they did things that they said they would never do again. They did these things in the 70s to deal with the crisis at that point, which led to stagflation. And as we just talked about, that might be the case that we have next year. We might have stagflation again. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, lo and behold, the similar policies produce similar results. And yes, Marxists called it. Maybe we'll include the links to some of these articles in the in the notes for this episode. And you can see that what we were saying at the time in 2020 <clears throat> It holds up against what happened. And what the Bank of Canada said does not hold up. They were made basically saying, don't worry about it. Um, don't worry about the, uh, the, the inflation. It's not going to, this is, won't cause inflation um, because you have low interest. And, <clears throat> and don't worry about the debt. Don't worry about the debt because we have low interest rates. <laughs> and we'll get into the debt in a minute. But obviously everything is turned into its opposite now. And now all of these things that they said were not going to be a problem are a massive problem um, and they've run really running out of uh, tools actually <laughs> to, to solve the problem that's why the t the methods they're using to solve it are actually just blatant punishment of working class people um, Alex yeah I actually I, I'm reminded of a debate I had with somebody who was saying that oh quantitative easing it's not money printing and it's not inflationary uh it's a perfectly good thing to do which then raises the question all right if it's not inflationary and it's not money printing why are they stopping it why do you do it all the time if it's great you can just you know you could do that all the time of course it's money printing functionally and it's inflationary and that's why they've stopped doing it now yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> if if there is just a magic money tree that you can constantly shake and money falls out of it, why not just always do that? Um, but everyone knows at the end of the day, the the material reality has a say that you money does not grow on trees and it cannot just fall out of nowhere without having any impact on the economy. And yes, this has led to inflation. So onto the question of inflation. Inflation is a real problem. <clears throat> it's a massive problem. Now, the last number we have is from October, I believe. I don't think they have a November number yet, but it's at, it was at 6.9%. So it, this is down from 8.1% in the summer, but this is just an average, actually. So I think the average isn't actually that useful because in categories like basic foodstuffs like pasta, butter, most meats, uh, rice, um, a lot of things, gas, gas is crazy, but, but basic foodstuffs is, is double, at least double the, the inflation rate. And, and this is stuff that you generally speaking, you can't go without, right? It's not luxury items you're purchasing or something like that, that you can maybe not, you don't need, this is, you absolutely need it. Right? So the inflation rate is much higher and the, and the, and this really, really, really hurts, uh, poor working class families here. So yes, the inflation rate, the inflation is a problem. It is. It is a, it's it's slowly grinding and it's it, it adds on top of itself, right? So every month, more and more money is going out of your pocket, and you have less and less of uh, a wiggle room in your in your personal budget, right? For families, um, and yeah, yeah. So this is this is a real problem, and and so the the Bank of Canada is trying to address a real problem that we've just laid out that they caused themselves, um, and. Yes, their solution is potentially worse than the problem <laughs> um, uh, in raising interest rates. So the interest rate was at, like for years, was at a all-time low. It was at, I think, 0.25 or maybe even lower for a little bit. And now they have an, 
within a period of several months, it's been massively jacked up to now it's at 4.25%. Uh, they just increased it last week by 0.5. Um, and they'll probably continue to increase it. As Alex has explained, Macklem is not as concerned about undershooting or uh, overshooting the mark. He's concerned about undershooting. So I think there that signals that they probably will increase it a little bit more even. Um, what this means, if this is all just a bit of gobbledygook economic language for you, what that basically means, this is the base interest rate set by the Bank of Canada, that all other loans set by private banks adhere to. So if you have uh, a line of credit that's prime, this is what prime is, prime plus whatever, 2% or whatever it is, um, or your mortgage, you know, this means that all debt will is, is already become and it is becoming more expensive, um, that you'll be paying less on the principal of the debt and more on the interest. Um, so yeah, this is, yeah, went from a record low to, I don't know if this is a record high interest rate, but it's a no. very high interest rate. No. Um, I, I, yeah, I think, they, I think in the seventies or eighties, it, it got above 10% actually. So, oh, wow. Did it? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, this, uh, as we as Alex already described, uh, will quite, quite likely bring on a recession. And uh, they're not they're not all that concerned about that. I think I think actually they're toying. If you if you read between the lines of what they're saying, not just the Bank of Canada, but a lot of economists, mainstream economists, is is they actually kind of think that the recession might be necessary to bring down the inflation rate by basically sucking money out of the economy in the form of layoffs, uh, cuts, um, uh, yeah increased debt payments makes it so you have less money to spend and therefore maybe the brings down the the amount of demand so-called demand in the effective demand in the economy it sucks liquidity out of the economy essentially um yeah so this is this is the situation with inflation that they're and they're raising the interest rates which is going to make everybody's uh, uh debt uh much more <clears throat> expensive um yeah, so uh, just before we get into the question of debt, because, you know, is that a big problem? I don't know. Maybe we should get into the numbers. I'd just like to take a short commercial break. You are listening to This Week in the Canadian Revolution, a podcast uh, by Fightback, the Marxist voice of labor and youth. Uh, in addition to this, we have a website, marxist.ca in English and marxist.qc.ca in French. I encourage you to check out our website. You can read. We have daily analysis of all of the issues uh, in Canadian politics in the class struggle. Um, as well, we also produce uh, uh, paper uh, magazines. Uh, we have Fight Back, <clears throat> which comes out uh, bi-weekly. It's basically every two weeks uh, in English. Uh, and we have uh, a growing subscriber base, and we invite you to be a part of it. Um, so yeah, you can go to our website and uh, marxist.ca slash subscribe and subscribe to be to our paper. And we encourage you to actually be a sustaining subscriber. So by paying a monthly amount, you help us do what we do. Yes, and we have many people who have uh, become new subscribers to fight back this in the last week. So just in the last week, from Tuesday to Tuesday, we've had uh, 11 new fight back subscribers. We have David. Uh, Anna, Bera, Aaron, Anna, Mitchell, Mate Matthias, Eric, Lucas, Mary, and Corey. So thank you, comrades, friends, supporters, uh, for becoming subscribers to Fight Back. And then in French for La Lipo Socialiste, which is our French publication that comes out once every month, we have four new subscribers. We have Jean-David, Maria, Christelle, and Xavier. So uh, thank you, comrades, supporters, friends, for subscribing to La Post Socialist. And I, I encourage everyone here, uh, even if you don't read French, subscribe to La Post Socialist. It's a very, it's a good opportunity to actually learn French and and then and understand more uh, uh, Quebecois politics. <clears throat> so yes, uh, in particular, this is, these are our publications, and I encourage you to support us by becoming a subscriber. Um, back into it. So this increasing interest rate. Uh, will increase the cost of debt. But is debt really that much of a problem? 
Uh, uh, well, uh, let's yeah, let's get into it. Well, the household uh, current household debt, <clears throat> I believe it's a record. I'm not entirely sure, it but is, I believe yeah, it's it totally a record. is. Yeah, it's at 185 percent of household income. So if you think about it, for every dollar that a family, a household brings in, they owe one dollar and eighty five cents in debt. Now, why is this an issue? I mean, <laughs> you, you can imagine it, it is an issue, but but what, what what does this actually mean? Well, in in the nineteen eighties, this was the last inflationary crisis that Canada had. Inflation actually got over twelve percent for a period of time, uh, and the Bank of Canada's current policy of raising interest rates to bring down inflation is based on this. What they did at the time, they raised interest rates. Uh, to do what we've already described, to bring down inflation, suck money out of the economy. Um, and it actually worked. The inflation rate eventually got under control. They brought it down to around 2% or less. And uh, <clears throat> and it did push some people to bankruptcy, like some poor people that were super indebted, couldn't afford to pay their debt, went bankrupt, couldn't uh, pay for their home, had to sell their home, whatever, right? But not that many people, to be honest, when you look at it. It wasn't a wide that wide layer of society. Um, and that was because... At the time, households owed uh, f 50 cents to every dollar they brought in. So they were bringing in twice as much money as they owed. Whereas now, you see, they owe uh, almost 200% of their income in debt. So, so the, the situation is completely different. So what this means is the raising of interest rates is going to have a much more dramatic effect. And already, you can read in any... Uh, I read some stories in CBC and CTV and other news sources about working class families that already they've already folded. They've they've given up their home. They they cannot afford it already, and it's just begun. So I think that this is uh, this policy pursued by the Bank of Canada is going to push millions of people into impoverishment and potentially bankruptcy, um, and that's just one side of it. Um, so yeah, this is. This is uh, the effect of the raising interest rate. It seems like probably to many working class families, just cruel punishment um, that anyone with a, uh, in particular mortgage, so mortgage mm -hmm, debt mm -hmm. in Canada, Canadian households are actually the mo most indebted of the G, uh, the G, uh, I believe it's the G8 nations, the main, uh, main capitalist economies in the world. Canada uh, households are the most indebted and two thirds of that household debt is actually mortgage debt which is $2.1 trillion uh, in debt held by Canadian households. Um, so yeah, this is a, a massive problem. It's, a, it's like a dead weight on, on, uh, on the economy, on consumer spending. And this, 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 this amount of debt is going to become unwieldy. It's going to become very difficult for people to afford. There's already stories of, of families having their mortgage payments increase by upwards of $1,000 a month. You can imagine all of a sudden you have to pay a thousand. You're in, you have minus a thousand dollars a month. I think very with inflation few on top of that. <laughs> with inflation on top, I think very few families could afford this. Very few families could afford it. You'd have to cut in all sorts of of areas. And actually, you already see this. There's there's stories of I think thirty percent of families are actually eating less food. Um, uh, there's stories. There's there's increased use of food banks. We actually just published our latest paper that dealt with the issue of food banks. Um, there's uh, yeah, increased use of food banks, and also from layers of the population that wouldn't normally use food banks. Right? You normally associate food banks with the the ultra poor, maybe the homeless or something like that. Right? But no, this is students and working class families using food banks, and this is in Canada, which is one of the best of all capitalisms. So this is the best of all capitalism. Capitalism isn't doing so hot these days. Um, so yeah, this is the problem of of consumer debt. Um, I don't know, Alex, you look like you want to come in here. Do you, is there anything you have to say about this? Yeah, well, it, it all compounds, right? So as you said, say somebody whose mortgage was, say, $2,000 a month, now will be $3,000 or even $4,000 a month. And, and then on top of that, their groceries are, you know, when they were previously spending, you know, say four or five hundred dollars a month now they're paying uh six or seven thousand dollars so hundred dollars a month on groceries um so that's all going up so it's extra costs and then if tip macklem and the bank of canada causes a recession 
you might lose your job. Could you imagine? Like you, you probably have trouble, you have serious troubles paying for all of these things if you keep your job. But if you lose your job, you are up up a creek without a paddle. Yeah. So this is a this is a very dire situation for most working class people in Canada. And yeah, it must seem like it, it seems like a cruel joke, to be honest. Oh, rising inflation. Um, cost of goods, everything's getting more. Everyone's feeling the everyone's feeling the pinch at the grocery store. I know I go to the grocery store. My my groceries are costing way more than they used to. Having to having to actually actually pay way more close attention to budget. <laughs> I think everyone is. Um, and then the, the, it seems like a cruel joke. The solution is, oh well, now we're going to make your debt more expensive too. What? How yeah. does this make any sense? Conveniently. As we've already talked about, the COVID bailouts, most went to corporate. So, so their theory is, oh, there's too much money in the economy. We need to, we need to cool it down. The, employment, the unemployment rate is too low, meaning we need to fire some people. Um, they, they, they talk a lot about this, right? But they don't talk about the vast majority of the COVID money that went to corporate bailouts, as we've discussed. Actually, funny enough, that, that $700 billion they, that borrowed and went to, they, they, they're masking they actually mask where it is. We know because we, we we write articles about this thing. You can read it on read on Marxist.ca, and we're trying to investigate it. And they they mask where it went exactly. It's just in COVID supports vaguely. Yeah, COVID supports. I, and, for, and, and, for they're who? and they're blaming Serb, right? It's like yeah. they're, they're actually chasing working class people up for one or two thousand dollars here and there. And yep. I'm penny pinching every single bit of it. Whereas the wage subsidy and the other handouts, totally hands off, totally hands off. Oh no, I forgive that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And that's, uh, again, so every dollar that went to working class people, there was $10 that went to corporations and absolutely no follow-up. And actually they're being, it's being kept secret to uh, uh, create this mantra of make the workers pay. It's the working class fault. make the workers pay uh, through various different attacks and cutbacks. Yeah, and as I said, conveniently, yeah, yeah focus on the CERB, uh, focus on consumer spending of working class people, uh, and uh, conveniently uh, leave out the massive bailouts to corporations, including actually, which is, is infuriating, I think. Uh, and they haven't actually, this isn't widely known, bonuses paid to the Bank of Canada <laughs> managers like Tiff Macklem have gotten... I believe fifty-four billion, or sorry, fifty-four million dollars in the past couple of years over the COVID pandemic for causing inflation. Yep. So they they cause the problem. They get massive benefits. Don't worry about that. But you should be poorer. Um. And yes. And, and, and the com yeah. And the sorry, companies go that got wage subsidies, they gave uh, executive bonuses, even though they got wage subsidies. They bought back their shares to artificially inflate the prices of their shares, gave dividends to shareholders. So massive sort of taking all the government money, using creative accounting to get it, and then giving those uh, uh, corporate bonuses to everybody. And, and, and this ended up on the balance sheet last year. Canadian CEOs got 32 percent extra compensation they so supposedly that that's not a concern to tiff macklin and what was it uh corporate canada increased its profits by 109 percent last year but it's the workers fault it's all the workers fault corporations this is capitalism so if you have a little doubt in your mind about whether or not capitalism is a good system well this is the system this is the logical conclusion of the capitalist system um moving on so we're talking about a lot about household debt but household debt's not the only problem um government debt so the canadian government as we've described uh, went massively into debt to deal with the economic collapse in 2020 triggered by the COVID pandemic, not caused by the COVID pandemic, but it was a triggering factor. Uh, the economy was already weep, quite weak, as uh, we've described previously. Um, but yeah, so the government, this, this caused the government debt to balloon uh, to record proportions. Um, currently, the, so it more or less 
doubled the federal government debt at least i think all the levels of government debt doubled and the now the consolidated government debt of all areas of government federal provincial and all areas of government is basically almost three trillion it's probably more i couldn't get a number for 2022 but according to stats can it's over 2.9 trillion dollars which is more than the gdp the gross domestic product of the country so similar to households the canadian economy uh the government is more indebted owes more money than the economy produces so that's 140 percent or 147 percent uh the government owes uh compared to the gdp of the of the uh, country and this as you probably tell this is absolutely unsustainable um but uh Interestingly enough, the, the, the managers of capital, the, the Bank of Canada, uh, in 2020, when they were pursuing this policy of massive, uh, I don't even know if you describe it as Keynesianist, but it was deficit, deficit spending, basically going massively into debt. Um, basically, it's like if you were just, you know, lost your job and you're running up your credit card every month. Um, basically, they said, uh, don't need to worry about the debt. It's not going to be a problem. Uh, because interest rates are low <laughs> so don't so don't worry about it but now as you can probably tell this nearly three trillion dollars in government debt is already starting to be a problem it is going to be a huge problem because that 4.25 percent interest rate which is probably going to increase also applies to the government debt and the proportion i don't have numbers about it yet but the proportion of the government budget that goes to finance not not pay down the debt. I'm talking about just the interest payments on that massive sum of money is going to take an increasing portion of the budget, which means there'll be less money in the government to other things like healthcare, education, uh, wages, government jobs, uh, transfer payments to provinces, etc. And this is going to cause a big, big, big problem. The logical conclusion of this is austerity measures. So we haven't seen that much significant austerity measures in the past couple of years. Trudeau is kind of mantra was almost putting a pause on that um, through deficits financing after years of uh, Harper conservative austerity. He was just trying to, to, to avoid dealing with the problem, putting a, pushing the pause button on, on the crisis, dealing with the crisis of capitalism and uh, increasing the deficit. But, and then with the COVID it's massively increased, but now it's gotten to a point where they, they really can't avoid dealing with it. And it's going to be an, uh, an increasingly impossible amount of money to pay. Um, so yeah, the logical conclusion of this is inflation or sorry, is, uh, sorry, is, uh, is, uh, austerity. Now this, uh, if, as you can tell, we already talked about how we could be hitting a recession next year. We will, most likely, and could have stagnation with inflation. Now, with also massive government debt, um, mass bankruptcies, and austerity. And, um, and austerity measures. It's a perfect storm of capitalist misery, to be honest, with um, you know little room to maneuver. Uh, normally, Canadian capitalism was a bit more... Uh, had 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 some fat in the system. They could maneuver a little bit. Uh, you, as you can tell, there's very little room to maneuver here. Massive indebtedness, um, huge inflation rate uh, has left the government with very little room to maneuver. And so, yeah, you can't avoid the crisis of capitalism. It is coming to bear on all of our lives. Um, so I don't know. I guess don't want to be a downer. It's got to be a solution. <laughs> got to be a solution to this. <laughs> um, we, 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 we're, we're confident. We're optimistic. We're Marxist. We believe there is a solution to this problem, uh, which isn't uh, make you poor, like the Bank of Canada says. This is not the solution. Um, so yeah, maybe we can get into a bit of like, what, what are, are there solutions floating around out there? Are there people that are criticizing the government for their policy? Um, so yeah, we have, I guess, first things first, probably the person that's made the most noise is uh, Pierre Polyev. Um, or the new leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, who's who's made a lot of noise about the inflation. I don't know, Alex. Do you want to talk about that? Or? Yeah. Well, well Polyev has called it just inflation, and and, and he criticised the government uh, uh, deficits, and he criticised the quantitative easing. That and yes, those things did cause 
the inflation, but or part of the inflation, but he's totally silent about the role of corporate Canada. He's he's never going to cri criticize the 32% compensation increase to CEOs or 109% increase in corporate profits. He'll never do that. And, and in fact, all he ends up doing is attacking any kind of benefit that goes to workers. And they, you know, there's this uh, sort of very pathetic little uh, $500 uh, rent, supposedly rent handout uh, negotiated between the Liberals and the NDP. And Polyev is blaming that for inflation. And I'm sorry, actually, that money is far too modest. It's not going to have a significant effect on the lives of those working class people. And in fact, actually, minimum wage workers are too rich for it. If you're a full-time minimum wage worker, you earn too much money to get that benefit. And so that's going to have absolutely no role on inflation. So all Polyev is really doing is doubling down on austerity. He's going to be doubling down on, on attacking the working class. And that and that's where him and Tiff Macklem agree is make the workers pay. They'll make the workers pay in different ways, but at the end of the day, they make workers pay. Yeah, so I think we really see this well. Well, it seems in the debate that Polyev is vociferously opposed to the government and the bank of governor of the bank or and the bank of canada like he said he wants to fire tiff macklin i guess we could probably agree with him on that one we're not we're not very happy with tiff macklin either oh, obviously we've stated why um and he's gaining a bit of traction i mean i believe they're ahead in the polls because he has this sort of populist message but when you read between the lines when you look at what polyev is actually proposing he doesn't disagree on the content the content of what the canadian of the justin trudeau Christian Freeland, the finance minister, and Tiff Macklin of the Bank of Canada, is that working class people should pay. And uh, Polyev basically says the same thing. Working class people should pay. Well, they say, Bank of Canada says, a governor of Bank of Canada says the unemployment rate is too low, therefore you need mass layoffs. Polyev says, yes, but they should be public sector jobs that are lost. This is uh, extreme hypocrisy. Now, he's not someone who... He, he is someone who is known for extreme hypocrisy, so this is not surprising. We should get used to his statements, much like Trump's statements, where he's criticizing something that people hate, but his solution is is just more of the same, but in a different way. Um, yeah, so it's criticizing government spending, uh, and in particular, supports for poor people. Uh, and, and Polyev also is conveniently, just like Macklem, avoiding talking about the, the money that went to corporate supports, not really focusing on that so much, um, really kind of hating poor people, to be honest, it seems like, similar to Macklem. Um, so yeah, obviously, get that one out of the way. Obviously, I don't think people listen to this podcast have illusions in Polyev, but we should know the arguments against this sort of thing. Um, that leads on to the NDP and Jagmeet Singh, um, who are also criticizing the inflation. Uh, Singh is calling it greedflation. Um, he's basically saying that inflation is caused by corporate profiteering. Now, there's a certain truth to this. I think a certain element of it is caused. There is, I think, some companies are taking advantage of the situation to 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 profiteer. But but the question I'd have just is like, yeah, what what is this? Is this just all of a sudden they decided this year to profiteer extra? And also, even if that's true, what is Singh proposing to do about it? So according to the proposals that Singh has put forward and what he said is they want to tax excess profits. So I guess the first things first I would say is, one, how do you determine what an excess profit is? So they're fine with corporations profit, profiting massively off of us, but just not too much, anything excess. So, I mean, you have to set up such a, a, a crazy bureaucratic apparatus in the state to track excess profits and then how would you actually tax that? And then one, even if you were able to do that, the, uh, what's stopping the company from just passing that tax on to the consumer and increasing prices again? And then further profiteering um, or whatever. And also what's stopping if you, if you really infringe on capitalist, capitalist profiteering? I think profiteering is built into capitalism. That's what it is all about. Um, 
they just could take their money out of the economy, close up shop, take the money out of the economy. So I think what Singh, well, Singh is obviously pointing a bit more in the right direction is falling up a bit short because Singh, Singh is a reformist. Singh ultimately is accepting the capitalist market. You see even by excess profits. No, profits are okay. Just the excess ones are not okay. Um, he's falling short to have an actual solution here. And so therefore the, the solution really lacks teeth in what Singh is proposing. Uh, Alex, you want to come in on this? Yeah, well, well actually, if you look at the NDP's platform, there's nothing to deal with inflation. That they this is also true. <laughs> they they supported the the wage subsidy, which is the main means of corporate handouts. They supported that. Actually, they they even put out a press release at the time bragging for it, about it, saying this was our idea and we for, we made Justin Trudeau do this. It's like it was your idea for corporate welfare. So it's, you should be embarrassed about that, not bragging about it. And and they they've quietened down on that a little bit now and, and that's inflationary so they they've got no policy for infl for inflation their their only policy is very 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 minor handouts so to hopefully help the poorest of the poor weather a little bit of the inflation but it's not stopping the inflation and it's so very modest and yeah, we could say if you know if they tax the rich, the you know then the corporations could pass those prices on to the consumer. But the reality is, at the end of the day, they the taxes end up being so incredibly moderate that there's no money to give any decent uh, reforms for working class people be because they're, they're incredibly modest pseudo reformism, and they're tied to the liberals. They're tied to the liberals now, and and that is discrediting the NDP more and more and more and and it's doing yeah they could sometimes they criticize the liberals and then everybody says but you're propping them up that makes no sense if you criticize them you, then you need to vote against them and you need to propose something that will actually make a difference will actually end inflation but you can't end inflation when cor the corporations have all the control of the economy when you've got pe people like Tiff Macklem at the end of Bank, Bank of Canada who are blaming a wage price spiral for inflation, blame, blaming workers' wages for inflation, even though workers' wages have been under inflation for years and years and years. Yeah, so the NDP really isn't proposing anything meaningful. Yeah, well, we really see the, the problem with the reformist mindset of just tinkering with the system. And it's trying to get, I think what the argument is like, as far as I can tell from what Jagmeet and others in the NDP say is people need supports now, something, we need to do something now. It's this argument and something now, now people are, are struggling. So, so they, they kind of, then they fall into this very minor, uh, oh, pressure the liberals. But I, I don't think there's a lot of pressure on the liberals, to be honest. I think the liberals would probably do a lot of this stuff anyway, right? Like even the dental care plan, we talked about it in previous episodes, it's not, it's not a dental care plan. And the amounts of money are very small, and they're only earmarked for a certain amount of people making less money for kids under 12. So <clears throat> it's, again, very bureaucratic. Like if you want to get any of this, this these small amounts of money, uh, you have to, you know, it's means tested. You have to go through a, a, a bureaucratic gauntlet to, to get it. So I think, yeah, a lot of what the NDP is proposing, they're stuck in this mentality of like, get something for workers now. And so they end up, they're supporting the government and discrediting themselves. And you, you can see that in all the polls. I mean, they're not going up in the polls. They're not getting any, there's no enthusiasm behind the NDP. Um, uh, and unfortunately, I think Polyev has capitalized a bit on this anger against the establishment and, and potentially he could in the next few years, if this situation keeps up, he really could railing against inflation and the calling for the firing of Tiff Macklem and whatnot. So, yeah, this comes into the socialist solution it flows from what you're trying to do. Right. We're we're opposed to capitalism. We describe all these problems as a logical conclusion of the capitalist system. And therefore, and we don't fight for a little piecemeal, like a little gain, a little thing, you know, a little bit of money. Like one thing that the NDP leg takes credit for is they double the GST rebate, uh, for the, which which is a very small amount of money, right? <laughs> um, 
which which amounts to about forty one dollars a year. It's like okay, that's that that's cool, but I mean, this is a drop in the bucket to all these other things that we're talking about. No, we so we so but but this this is this is really gets into the socialist solution that that the all these problem all these proposals of the NDP really avoid the question of private ownership of the means of production. These companies are gonna they have a million and one ways of getting around any constraints, right? Uh, passing the, the the increased cost onto the consumers and all this, and so this is why we really need to have a you know a, a socialist response. Nationalization of corporate if the, if there is profiteering, nationalization, working class people can control it. Um, yeah, like uh, we've already paid for it. We've already paid for it with all these bailouts. Exactly. Um, if capitalism so great, why did it need to be bailed out in the first place with our money that now we're having to foot the bill for bailing these bastards out? It's funny when you lend money to people, normally, you know, if I lend you thousand dollars, I'm going to come back to you at one point and say, Alex, you got to pay me the thousand dollars back. But what happened here is these hundreds of billions of dollars shoveling the corporate coffers and then they're coming to you and they're coming to us. We're going to say, oh, you need to pay for this. It's a very funny sleight of hand that capitalism constantly does. Oh, we got no money. We gave it to corporations, so you you have to pay for that. Uh, well, not if we're socialist. They they, mm -hmm. they can't they can't actually describe. Or they quite often people say, oh, socialism is just stealing other people's stuff, using other people's money. It's like, no, actually, what's happening is currently the opposite. Actually, uh, quite clearly. <clears throat> so yeah, I guess this gets into. Yeah, like I said, we don't want to be pessimistic here. What, what is to be done, right? Uh, what what can we do? Obviously, socialism sounds good. We want that, but how can that actually be fought for concretely? How can we fight concretely against capitalism? Um, uh, yeah, this relates to uh, the class struggle, um, which is which is increasing uh, as of late. I don't know, Alex, if you want to introduce this point. Yeah, there's been more and more strikes. And, and inflation causes strikes that in the past union uh, leaders would negotiate a, a zero or one percent wage increase when inflation was two percent and people didn't like it, but they kind of shrugged their shoulders and go, all right, all right. But when inflation is six, seven or eight percent, people will not take a one percent wage increase. They just won't. And so that's why you're getting uh, more and more strikes. Actually, in Britain, there's a massive strike wave now. I, I think uh, it's one of postal workers and rail workers and nurses, you know, they're, they're all going on strike. Uh, so there's a massive strike wave in Britain and there's been an element of a strike wave in Canada. It's, it's early days yet, but the most notable one was the Ontario education workers uh, organized with QP that uh, originally were asking for 11% uh, annual wage increases, which uh, would have allowed them to keep their head above inflation and, and get a little bit of catch up for a money they've lost in the previous decade. And, and so there's gonna be more of that and more of that and more of that. And so the first way you fight against this crisis is by union militancy, by labor militancy, demanding that wages keep up with inflation. And then if you're getting austerity coming on top of that, then there needs to be strikes and mass mobilization against those cuts and austerity and those job cuts too in the public sector. So that's, uh, you know, you've, you've got to fight, but you also have the leadership that is willing to fight. Yeah, well, that's related to what we're trying to do here. So the class struggle is a fact. Uh, the class struggle is not something created by Marxists or revolutionaries. It is created by the capitalist system. And as you can probably tell from all of the, the things that we've described, this is, this is leading to an increase in class struggle, strikes, union conflicts. It's leading to, a, there's, a, there's a wave of unionizations in the US that's taken off. I think it's over 260 Starbucks that have unionized and they've gone on strike too. Um, this is all connected to this, the working class kind of waking up after a long slumber and there's been many key strikes and they, yeah this uh this uh, strike of the qp education workers in ontario that we followed closely was one of them uh, a fantastic inspiring strike uh, two days of a legal strike 
defeated the Ford government. Uh, you saw Ford, he was a, almost a changed man. He was scared after, <laughs> shows what one ounce of leadership uh, can do. Uh, and yeah, forced for the first time ever a government to retract the uh, a back to work legislation um, that had been tabled, that had been implemented previously. Um, so yeah, um, and I think that this is just the beginning of this. Um, this is just the beginning of uh, uh, increasing working class struggle because inflation, as we've talked about previously, we've written on it. We have many articles. Maybe we're going to share some in the show notes in the in the notes for this podcast. Uh, inflation leads to class struggle, as as Alex was describing. All these trade union contracts, it, it, the, it, the whole negotiations is just plagued with conflict because there can't be any agreement. The working class is doesn't want to accept what is essentially a decrease in real wages, and and uh, and the capitalist doesn't want to pay a huge wage increase, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is the essence of the class struggle. It's a struggle over over some basic, you know, a basic question of wages uh, f- for the workers. And yeah, this is this is this is the really the bread and butter of the class struggle. And through this struggle, I think workers start to learn and start to relearn actually relearn the militant traditions um, that in some ways have been lost actually uh, you need to fight to win uh, there's a saying in Quebec uh, sur la lutte pays, only the struggle pays uh, <laughs> I like it it's like you gotta fight to win right you have to go on strike you have to you know I know some people say oh but a strike's disruptive I'm like that's the point actually mm-hmm. you disrupt you shut down the 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 system ultimately you stop capitalism from functioning and and you show who the real power is um but yeah as alex has said uh and yeah and i think actually just first things first that this struggle could is going to be could also be on the against against austerity measures because you could have you could have layoffs in the public sector wage cuts compressions to deal with this massive government debt that we've talked about could be on the provincial level could be on the federal level um but yeah uh, we don't know exactly but obviously the situation is pregnant with possibilities uh for class struggle as working class people uh, really can take no more and i think many people are being pushed to the edge of this now so yeah class struggle is uh inherent in the situation is a very progressive thing right obviously it's not all negative the negative the, the good good comes with the bad is that working class people realize that capitalism doesn't serve them anymore and they start to fight back. Um, but yeah, that being said, uh, as Alex talked about, uh, this class struggle needs leadership. And this is the role of Marxists, that Marxists need to help workers relearn those lessons, learn the lessons of past struggles and learn ultimately not just how to fight for better wages, but how to how to do away with this system once and for all, which is creating so much misery, right? And how to fight for a, 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 a socialist future. Uh, Alex? Yeah, and, and the need for socialist leadership in the labor movement is absolutely vital. So you, we had the uh, fantastic illegal strike, potential general strike, against the back to work legislation and notwithstanding clause. And so, and, and, a, and a really resounding victory there against the legislation but because the leadership of qp and leadership of the labor movement does not have a socialist perspective does not view capitalism as an unjust system that needs to go and they're always thinking oh what is possible under capitalism then they proceeded to sign a contract that only gave the workers one dollar when they were asking for 325 only gave the workers one dollar and then proceeded to do a massive demoralization campaign amongst those workers to get them to sign that sub-inflation wage cut deal anything less than 325 is a wage cut that's what our comrades were saying and and that's why you got to link the struggle for day-to-day demands with the struggle for a socialist society, which which is the sort of real solutions to inflation. Like we've got a strike for wages above inflation here here and now, which give the workers the understanding of their own power in defeating the capitalist class. But then that gives us the political power to be able to take more socialist aims and not just wages, socialist aims like, yes, don't just tax the corporations, you've got to expropriate them. Rather than giving them bailouts, 
Uh, they're going to be taken under workers' control. And then we can open the books, find out uh, where all of the uh, the costs and balances are coming from and make sure and then really hold on to inflation that way. We need to kick out Tiff Mac Macklem and the corporate governors of the Bank of Canada. That needs to we need to nationalize the big banks, uh, or the big six banks that control most of banking in Canada, put them under control of working class people that will allow us to control the money supply, would allow us to in control investment, make sure that resources are going where they're needing. You know, there's a homelessness problem. There's a housing crisis. Let's invest in public and social housing. Use those resources. The resources exist. The socialist resources, you can get rid of inflation. You can get rid of the capitalist crisis. You can get rid of austerity. And the first element is, yes, class struggle to help workers understand they have the power because they have the power. But class struggle, proper socialist leadership that sees the aim of all of these struggles is the overthrow of capitalism. That's the way to deal, move from today to the socialist future that we need. Yeah, I think uh, to end it off, I think it's a good way to end it off here that, you know, we're at the end of the year. I think it's been a difficult year for many people. I think, I think many people faced with this horrible situation are quite depressed and despondent, right? But I think we are not, we are not depressed. We are not despondent. Uh, we are not disillusioned because of what we just described. We have, and Marxists have absolute faith in the working class, that the working class will rise up faced with this situation, will rediscover his militant revolutionary traditions. And that is already beginning as we've described here uh, and will ultimately uh, do away with the capitalist system. And we are here to build the forces of Marxism, to help the working class win, to lead the workers to victory. And I encourage everyone uh, listening to this podcast, if you if you like the analysis here, if you appreciate what we're doing and you wanna get involved and you, you ultimately wanna help, help us, you wanna help the working class win in the fight against capitalism, uh, please get in touch with us. Go to Mar go to our website, marxist.ca, uh, fill out the join us request, uh, get involved uh, in the fight uh, for a socialist future, a confident socialist future that, uh, as opposed to the uh, the darkness of, of capitalism ultimately, which is making all of our lives worse. Um, so uh, yeah, to end it off here, I just wanna, you know, if you wanna get involved, um, there are many ways that you can. Uh, one of the ways is if you are in Toronto, in or around Toronto, we have a very special uh, a gathering happening this Saturday. Uh, we're trying to, we had a good year. We're, we're ending the year with a bang. We have a, uh, now we, this is something we used to do pre-pandemic, and this is the first time we're doing it in person since the pandemic hit. We have a Mark Smith party. Um, it's, uh, it's not just a social event. It's going to be political. We're going to have probably over 100 people there. It's going to be at the Cecil Community Center this Saturday at 7 p.m. The address is 58 Cecil Street in Toronto. You can find the details for that on our website uh, online. So, uh, yeah, please come out. Uh, we encourage people to register for this in advance. There are some costs associated with the room and the, the uh, sound system, for example. So, yeah, it's just 10 bucks. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll include the link in the notes for this. So please register, come out to Marksmith, meet other revolutionaries, confident revolutionaries that are, are fighting for a better society. And uh, last but not least, we also have uh, the biggest Marxist meeting in the country, our biggest sort of marquee public event of the year is coming up in February. We start mobilizing for it months and months in advance. It's, it's the Montreal Marxist Winter School. Uh, it's not just for people in Montreal, though. It's for people all over the country, even in, if you're in America, if you're in the United States, you're listening to this, we have international guests. We have uh, comrades coming up from our sister organization, Socialist Revolution in the US. And, you know, it's gonna be, uh, so the winter school, the Marxist winter school is gonna be on the weekend of <clears throat> the February 18th and 19th. There's already almost 150 people registered for this thing. Uh, we'll we'll have hundreds. I don't know how many. We're, we're aiming for 500. I don't know if we'll get there. We'll definitely probably get over 400 people registered. You should be one of them. We got people coming in from uh, 
British Columbia, Alberta, the, all over the prairies. Uh, we, we have a couple of buses booked coming from Toronto. If you're in Toronto and you want to come, you can take the bus with us and you can register for the winter school. You can see the, uh, the list of presentations which the theme is on building the revolutionary party, which is connected to what we were just discussing. We need to build revolutionary Marxist leadership in the movement to help the workers win. And the whole weekend is going to be dedicated to this question. Uh, and you can see the list of presentations and you can register for the winter school online on our website at marxist.ca slash school. So please register for the Montreal Marxist winter school and help us build the forces of revolutionary Marxism so we can build uh, an organization that can help the, uh, the working class win in the class struggle against the capitalist system. You have been listening to This Week in the Canadian Revolution, where we analyze the events of the class struggle, the turbulence and polarization brought upon by the crisis of the capitalist system in order to prepare activists for the coming revolutionary events so that we can fight back and build socialism in our lifetime. You can find us at marxist.ca and we will be doing this podcast every week. So we hope that you tune in again.